My name is Ken Bailey, and I'm happy to have you with me on this occasion as we try and look at two and perhaps three of what often are called minor parables. They certainly don't have the same number of extended characters, and perhaps these parables have not caught, caught the imagination of the reader quite the way some of the other more dramatic and larger parables. But nevertheless, the parables of Jesus, in a sense, are like the prophets. We talk about major prophets and minor prophets, where actually all we mean is that the major prophets are people who wrote a lot and the minor prophets have shorter books. In fact, they're all major prophets. And the message of, of Isaiah is profound and important and impressive, but the message of Amos, even though he didn't write as much, is equally of importance. So we want to look at, first of all, at uh, two of the shorter parables. Two are come together in a pair, and then a second, a third parable, as it were, that begins in the same part in the text, and this is in the 13th chapter of Luke, and beginning in the first verse, these three parables come together through verse 9. The introduction to them is striking and important. The text that I have before me says, there were some present at that very time who told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And the word present, some present, can also be translated out of the Greek to read, and some came at that very time and told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Again, our problem is to rescue truth from familiarity. We look at the person of Jesus and we quite naturally think of him as something quite unique and uh, we kind of put a whole halo around him and forget that he lived in a time of great stress and struggle, even as others at other periods of time have lived through very difficult times. And particularly, we have a tendency to depoliticize the world in which he lived. But this text calls for us to try and understand very precisely the nature of that kind of a world. We know, of course, Pilate was a Roman judge, Roman governor, sent by imperial Rome to run the country, and that the people around Jesus sensed that they were oppressed and sensed that they were being crushed by the cruel heel of a very powerful, aggressive, brutal world of the Roman Empire. And all of that is fair and true. And so thereby, we have to think about the psychology of a suppressed people as they sense the tremendous injustice done to them and as they reflect on their oppressors and what they've done. Many commentators have noted the fact that we really don't have any record of this event. Or others have tried to come up with some hints of an event of this kind in order to say, well, yes, this certainly happened, and here we go. Josephus, the historian contemporary with Jesus, didn't like Pilate, and every time he could find anything bad that Pilate had done, he was careful to write it up with full detail. But we don't have any record of any account like this. Now, I have no problem with this in the fact that I was, had the sad privilege of living through 10 years of the Lebanese Civil War, which began in 1975 and continued on for more than a decade. And so I know perfectly well the psychology of a people in the midst of very intense struggle. That psychology, in a sense, requires or produces atrocity stories. You get uh, one person injured by shrapnel in a bread line, and you let the community retell that story for about a week, and you'll end up with 300 people massacred by shelling that was directly fired at the bread line because they knew the people were standing waiting for bread, and even these poor folks who are standing in line for bread, you see how brutal and terrible their oppressors are that even there they point guns right at that bread line and kill all those people. Now, these kinds of stories serve a function in a community in the midst of great civil or political or military stress. Because you see, they're created in order to fire up the troops to get you into a state of utter rage. And then, of course, you will be inspired 
to go down to the front lines and start digging those trenches and go on those charges to try and overcome the enemy because they have done this terrible thing. People are not prepared to have anybody ask them, have you checked your sources? Are you sure that you've got the story straight? Are there any verifications for what you're telling us? No, no, that's not the purpose of the story. The story is either created out of nothing or a very simple incident is created into this great bloody massacre. And so I quickly recognize this same type of a atrocity story that we have here, and it's a bad one. Now imagine the scene. Here Jesus is being told a story about supposedly some worshipers went up to Jerusalem, they go in to offer their sacrifices, and Pilate sends in his defiled troops, could be defiled Jewish troops, or his Roman troops what would be pagans, and even worse. They go into the sacred precincts of the temple area, and they actually go into the inner part of the temple where the great high altar is, and they swing their swords, and they kill the worshipers who are there offering their atonement sacrifice for the sins, for their sins for the year, or the priest is doing it for them, and the blood of the worshipers and the blood of the sacrifice are mixed together as they come down off the altar. Now, horrible scene. I suppose the Christian equivalent would be, imagine some political enemy with which uh, you, you and your people might be at war, and then you rush up to someone and say, did you hear what happened? That those people came in and they gunned down our pastor and the blood of our pastor was mixed with the holy wine of the communion service on the floor of the church, and what do you think of that? Now, having been told atrocity stories like this for 10 years, I know perfectly well there's only one possible response, and that is you strike on your chest and, oh, Lord, how long? This is terrible. When, oh, Lord, are you going to hear the cries of your people and bring all of this to, to an end. Look at how much we are suffering and how terrible our enemies are and how innocent we are in the presence of these horrible enemies. You are required to make some kind of a response like that. The least you can do is fall silent, shake your head, indicate sympathy. Now, when these people come and tell Jesus this story, and maybe they've made the whole thing up, uh, one of the commentators of the medieval period, of the Arab commentators of the 13th century, this was a Syriac scholar in, in Syria in the, some, in the middle of the 13th century. His name is Ibn, al uh, Ibn Salibi, and he has, a, as a Middle Easterner, a very thoughtful comment. And he says that it looks to him like a trick. If you come with a story like this to Jesus, then you watch his response. If his response is, oh, Lord, this is terrible, will you not send down fire and get the Romans off our backs? Aha! Now he's made a public statement against the authorities. That can be then taken to the authorities in order that the authorities might watch him or take care of him or arrest him or whatever. If he doesn't make a statement like that, the people around watching are then able to say, well, this Jesus really doesn't care about our suffering. He was told a story about these poor people who were killed, and he didn't even bat an eye. He has no feelings. He, ha he has no concern. He he's got no compassion for this terrible world in which we live. Many people, and in the Middle East in particular, many people try to get information out of you by telling you something, quite often something they make up, in order to invoke a response from you. They try and get information out of you, if necessary, just by watching your face. How are you going to respond when you are told certain kinds of things? Because they want to find out your response, and even if you don't want to talk to them or give them any information, a clever manipulator with this kind of a psychology can evoke from you all kinds of information that they can't get any other way. So uh, this looks very much like what is happening here. So what does Jesus do? How does he respond? He responds by telling a parable, and the parable is amazing. It's got two stanzas, and there is a refrain. And we will turn now on our screens, and uh, you can follow along with me.
on the screen as I read the two stanzas, and please note as we read that the refrain in each case is identical. Here we are. Do you think that those Galileans, worse sinners they were than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower fell in Siloam and killed them, do you think worse debtors they were than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. All right, with this text in mind, let us then reflect on its meaning. So what is Jesus saying to this crowd? Two stanzas and a refrain, which in each case is the same. First of all, Jesus presumes that they have asked a question about sin and suffering. They haven't, but he answers the question in any case. What they want to do, as we indicated, was to invoke out of Jesus some kind of a response that they could use either to damage him with the community or to damage him with the authorities. He seems to ignore that threat, although certainly he was aware of it. And he starts off by affirming and saying, look, do not make a one-to-one -one relationship between sin and suffering. Now, we all know that many times people make wrong decisions in life and they make decisions which bring damage upon themselves. They do suffer because they made the wrong choices, the wrong choices of loyalty, the wrong choices of ethics. The definition of judgment in the Bible is not something that God does because he's angry, but the definition of judgment in the Bible is something we bring on ourselves because of the nature of the world in which we live. So you can imagine, for example, a lady has a young child and there's a tablecloth over the table, and the mother puts a, a pitcher of lemonade and says to her boy, um, Johnny, don't pull on the tablecloth, because if you do, the lemonade is going to come down on your head. So mom turns her back, and sure enough, Johnny pulls on the tablecloth, and mom turns around and tries to catch the lemonade and get it away from the head of the child, doesn't manage, the lemonade comes down on his head, and she quickly goes over, picks him up, and begins to comfort him. That's one thing. Another, th another scene would be mom tells Johnny, don't pull on the tablecloth, you'll get lemonade all over you if you do, and turns around and sees Johnny pulling on the tablecloth, and rushes over, picks up the lemonade, and says, I told you not to pull on the tablecloth, you no good so-and-so, and in anger, dumps the lemonade on her. Well, the second is a pagan understanding of judgment. The first is the biblical understanding. We are warned that certain kinds of actions will bring damage to us. And then we proceed, and sure enough, the damage comes as a result. Fair enough. That's all through the scriptures. It's all through our experience. We all know people who have made wrong choices in life and have been obliged to suffer from those wrong choices. But at the same time, the scripture is very clear that you cannot turn that equation around. You cannot say, this person is suffering, therefore they must be sinners. There is a tendency to do that. There was in Jesus' time. Remember the story of Jesus when he's talking to the man born blind in the book of John, and people ask the question, did this man sin or his parents? Is this a punishment of God? There you are, that pagan idea, you see. You sin, and so God gets mad and he clobbers you. And so this, this parable, as other places, Jesus says, no way. This is not a one-to-one -one relationship, and you cannot see a person who suffers and say, aha, God wouldn't have done this to them if they had not been sinners. God is not vengeful. He is compassionate and loving. The judgment he announces is something that comes as a result of our, of our uh, evil many times, and the mystery of why do the righteous suffer is never answered. Job suffers. He is a righteous man. He is not given an answer. What happens is, is that God walks on the stage and the question disappears. It is not answered. But in the awesomeness of the nature of the presence of the Lord of all, suddenly the question, we are satisfied and we are given, not given an answer. We are, we are there amazed. We are there in a state of worship. We are there overcome.
with the awesomeness of the mystery of the person of God. So this also gives no answer to it, but it clarifies a wrong answer which people sometimes make. But notice that's, uh, that's not our key point. Our key point is the fact that Jesus is saying to these people that they are sinners. In the midst of their pressure for him to make a strong nationalistic statement against the Romans, with great courage he turns to them and says, if you don't repent, you are going to die too. Now this goes way, way back even to the stories of the birth of Jesus, where the promise in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel says to Joseph that the child is to be born, his name is Jesus, in Hebrew, Yeshua, and he will save, the Hebrew word is Yesha. there's a play on words, the Savior will save, Jesus will save, Yeshua, Yesha. he will save the people from the Romans? No. From the Greeks? No. From the Gentiles? No. From their enemies? No. From their sins. And oppressed people are not interested in salvation from their sins. They want salvation from their political enemies. And Jesus is sent not to save Judea from the Romans. He is sent to save all of us from the powers of evil that somehow gain access in the hearts of all of us. So what else is he saying here in this very short and yet very, very important uh, parable? The way we read it is not perhaps exactly the way that you find it in your Bibles, but never mind. There are two key words in the text that are there that are not always translated uh, literally. The first, in the first stanza, Jesus says the Galileans were worse sinners. And when he's talking about the people on whom the tower fell, he says, do you think they were worse debtors? Now, how come these two words? Because, you see, the nature of evil is two kinds. One is things that we do which we shouldn't do, sins. And the other is things we should do which we don't do, omissions. I don't love God with all my heart as I should. I fail to love my neighbor as I love myself. I haven't done any evil act, but the requirements of love are for me beyond what I am able to do. This one is called debts, debts which I owe to God. I should be loving him with all my energies, and I'm not, and I should be loving my neighbor as myself, and I fail. Interestingly enough, the two forms of, this, of the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew, we, Luke has, sorry, Matthew has recorded, forgive us our debts. Forgive us the things that we've done, that, uh, the things that we fail to do. And then in Luke we have, forgive us our sins. And so various traditions of, uh, in the English language, pray, forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts, they're both right. Because in Aramaic, Jesus had a word, and the word was holba. And hoba meant, meant the things that you've done which you shouldn't do, and it also meant your inadequacies before your duty. And so with one word of the two sides, here the translator has been very careful in the Greek language to give us one side of hoba in the first stanza and one side of hoba, the other side of hoba in the other stanza. You see, Jesus, as he looks at this crowd who are coming with their angry, upraised fist, he has tremendous concern and compassion and interest in their cause, although I'm not sure that they saw it. What is his concern? His concern is he knows that, righteous, that people who fight for a righteous cause think that they are righteous. You see, this crowd who comes telling him this atrocity story about all the terrible things that Pilate has done, they are assuming Pilate is evil, fair enough, he was, and we are good, who said. Because we have an evil man oppressing us, this automatically makes us righteous. All across history we've seen this happening. It has been my sad privilege to watch this for decades. People struggling for a righteous cause think that they are righteous. They are not. They are sinners in need of salvation and cleansing. 
And if somebody doesn't care about the fact of the evil forces at work in the very people who are crying out for justice, then once they achieve power, that same evil force within them will lead them to oppress others, even as they themselves have been oppressed. And this is the sad, sad ringing of the changes of history. People struggle under injustice, they gain power, and they begin to oppress others. Why? Because as they struggled, they were not willing to be self-critical. They were unwilling to look deep within their own souls and say, our movement has evil within it. We are not the good fighting the evil. We are evil fighting evil. Yes, our oppression must stop, but we must also look deep within our souls. We, too, must need to repent. Now, notice something else that Jesus does. These people come with the suffering of a political act. Jesus recognizes that. And then he puts another act beside it, people on whom a tower fell which they were building, a tragedy, human, natural tragedy. And so very sort of nationalistic political types don't want to discuss any kind of suffering except their politically motivated suffering. And Jesus is saying to them, I'm not willing to discuss your suffering in isolation from other types. Let us now broaden the discussion, not just to the suffering of those killed by Pilate, but what about these poor builders when a tower fell on them and they died, and it was a tragedy for them. There are other kinds of suffering, my friends, other than the suffering that you're talking about. So he opens this also and makes that quite clear to his people. Very well, what have we learned from this this uh, brief parable about Pilate and about the Tower of Siloam. Well, first we've seen sin defined as the things, the evil acts that we do and the inadequacies to show love to God and to our neighbors, the omissions which we have in, in our souls. And second, we've seen that sin does not have a one-to-one -one relationship with suffering, that those who suffer are not to be condemned as sinners. And then third, we've seen that the struggle for justice does not take away our sins, does not take from us the fact that there is evil within the very movement that is struggling for justice, and Jesus is fully aware of this. And finally, we find that the compassion of Jesus is for all, not just for those who suffer political injustice. Okay, now we're ready to look briefly at the parable which comes immediately after this, which is also a good and important parable, although it's brief. And this occurs in Luke chapter 6, uh, sorry, chapter 13, starting in verse 6, in the same text that we have already examined. And you can open to the scripture there, or you can perhaps uh, look with us on the passage which we have are going to put on our screen before us, which you can then read in, on the screen as we go. So let us turn now to the screen and read our text. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Dig it out. Why should it exhaust the ground? But he answering said to him, Master, forgive it this year also until I dig around it and spread on manure. And if it bears fruit in the future, if not, dig it out. Very well, what is this little parable all about? Well, um, as in many of the parables, Jesus has a precedent. And the precedent that he is talking about is a parable like this that was told by the prophet Isaiah. And this is back in Isaiah chapter 5. We'll just read it for you, where God says through the prophet, Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He digged it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in, its, in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O, Jeru o inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, 
Judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled on. I will make it a waste, and it shall be not, not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. In, the, in this cha chapter, in chapter 27, we have another song of a vineyard, and it's a vision of a good vineyard that is really things are going well. So what is Jesus saying as he retells this classical song, one in, in the bad vineyard, which we have in chapter 5, and then the good vineyard, which we have in chapter 27? Here he starts off with the fig tree, and fig trees many times in the Old Testament are mentioned along with vineyards. And what's it all about? Well, the master plants the vineyard. Uh, the assumption was you let it grow for three years, then it starts to produce fruit, and for three years you leave it, and you don't pick the fruit because the tree, according to rabbinic tradition, is cleansing itself. Finally, the seventh year you expect fruit. This master says, I've come for three years. That's year seven, year eight, and year nine, and still no fruit. What is going to be done? We've got to cut this thing out. Why? Because it's using up the energies of the ground. Jesus is telling a different parable from the one in Isaiah. In Isaiah, the vineyard was bad. No, Jesus says, the vineyard is great. It's precious to me. But the energies of this corner of the vineyard are being used up because we have a tree which does not produce fruit. Isaiah was talking about the people. Jesus is talking about unfruitful leadership, which has to be cut out because fruitful leadership must find a place in the soil of the people in order to produce fruit. It is because of his concern for the vineyard that he wants this particular unfruitful a tree to be dug out. And then notice there wasn't any grace in Isaiah, but here there's grace. The grace is that the vine dresser says, no, master, don't cut it down. Let me dig around it and put on manure. Now, I think this is a joke. I'm sure there was some tittering around the audience as Jesus spoke. They figured out he was talking about the leadership of the community that was unfruitful. So what's the problem? Well, if we just dug a dump a little manure on them, maybe we'll get some fruit out of them. And it was kind of a dry humor, and I'm sure there was a kind of a joke that went around. Some people in the past have tried to say, this vine dresser and the master, this is God the Father and God the Son. No way. That's to put a tension within the heart of the Trinity. This is the voice of judgment and the voice of mercy, the voice of grace. And the two voices are there always within the heart of God where God is concerned for love and mercy and grace. And at the same time, if there is no production, no fruit, if there is no discipleship, no obedience, then God says these leaders have to go and other leaders must take their place. So what do we find briefly in this parable as we close it? First of all, Jesus is saying the spiritual leadership of the community of God's people must produce. Second, the lead, these leaders of any community of God's people, if they fail to produce fruit, they are not neutral. They are wasting the energies of the people of God. And third, we find that mercy Forgiveness and grace are always ready to be offered in the hope that there might then be some fruit from that leadership. We discovered that renewal is from beyond us because the tree does not out of its own pulling up its own bootstraps or all of a sudden shaking its leaves that it is going to turn around and become fruitful in the community of God's people. No, there must be new energy from beyond that can renew the church and its leaders. And finally, if there is no response, God cares for the, for the community that calls upon his name. And leadership which does not produce fruit will finally be turned aside that other leadership might be produced. And so here we find a new parable, starting off with the parable of Isaiah, retold in a different fashion
a parable of both grace and of judgment, a parable that speaks to God's people in any age and speaks to us.